Hello, everybody. This is Pamela. And this is Tracy. And we are here to discuss how business really works. Today, we are talking about your perceptions. Are they benefiting you or are they holding you back? Could they be wrong? And can you change your perceptions to get better results? Many people think of perception as being belief, but that's not really the case. Belief can affect your perceptions, but perceptions are the way we regard, understand, or interpret something. There are mental impressions. So can your perceptions be wrong? Most definitely, and they absolutely are. Okay, hang on a minute, Tracy, just hold up. You're saying that I am wrong about how I perceive things all the time? That doesn't make sense to me. Can you explain that? Yeah, you are wrong to some degree. It's just how your brain works. But my mom thinks I'm right all the time. (laughs) Well, you're lucky because my mom thinks I'm wrong all the time. (laughs) No, basically your brain has a coping mechanism. There's so much information coming at you every day and so many demands on us. And our brain just has to come up with this way to process all that. Because if you processed everything that came at you from scratch... You'd go insane. You would go absolutely crazy. So we have this coping mechanism, and it's called heuristic techniques. Hmm. And basically, they're an approach to how we learn, how we problem solve. And what we do is we develop these loose associations based on our previous experiences or, you know, on our beliefs, which are things that we just accept as reality, even if there's no personal experience to go along with them. Heuristic rules are learned and they're hard-coded in our subconscious and they allow us to make decisions and solve problems real quickly. Okay, but why is this a bad thing? If this is how our brains work, then why is it that our perceptions are wrong? Well, they're not always wrong when they work. You take a level one heuristic rule, which is what we kind of refer to as a gut instinct, Mm -hmm. You know, dog runs out in front of you as you're driving down the road. You immediately slam on the brakes and swerve. You don't think about it. It's just a reaction. Yeah. Same thing like if someone throws something at you, at your face, you're going to throw your hands up and duck. It's just a gut reaction. Mm. But then we have level two heuristic rules. And these are kind of what we refer to as like rules of thumb, educated guesses, your common sense. Mm -hmm. And the That's really why we create these, because sometimes they work. Sometimes it works efficiently, but sometimes it goes wrong. And it can go wrong in really bad ways. I mean, think of stereotyping, profiling, prejudices. Yeah. These errors are known as cognitive biases. Well, I'm familiar with cognitive biases, and I think most people have heard of confirmation bias. That's where you... You only selectively hear and accept and recognize information that supports your preconceived notions or beliefs. So we, I got that. Yeah. And you have its cousin, which is the observation expectancy effect, where you expect an outcome. So your unconscious influences how you actually perceive an outcome. Law enforcement deals with this all the time. You know, that's why two eyewitnesses can give an entirely different account of a crime Mm -hmm. because their cognitive biases are affecting their perception of what actually happened. Mm. Did you know that procrastination is a cognitive bias? Well, I didn't, but in light of what you've just said, it does kind of make sense. So it's basically your subconscious favoring today what's happening right now over the longer-term decision to invest in your future. Right. Would things like the placebo effect and groupthink also be cognitive biases? Yeah. There are actually over 150 known cognitive biases. Wow. That's scary. (laughs) It is. Um, (laughs) And we'll link to a list of those in the show notes so people can look them up. Now, I have several cognitive biases. I probably have more than I'm even aware of, but I have one that I can't beat, and it's called the ambiguity bias, and it's where you're not willing to make a decision if key pieces of information are missing. Ah. And for me, it comes to price or like an unclear understanding of what my money's buying. 
So, like, if you are trying to sell me something and I say, what's the price? And you won't tell me. You just keep going <laughs> this long, drawn-out sales process. And I get it. It works on a lot of people. Give them all the benefits where it's just they want it so bad. Then you hit them with the price. Right, well, right, right. Because I have this bias, you're just pissing me off. It doesn't matter how perfect this thing is, how much I really need it. You've set a situation now to where you're going to have to come up with the perfect price. It's going to be so low, I can't turn it down even though I'm mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, you can't come in too low because then it loses all of the value to me. So you're never going to sell me something at a premium price using that sales technique just because I have this bias. But I bet that you, so because this technique works so often, you are probably in the minority with this particular bias and salespeople use it because they know it works X amount of time, the majority of the time. So you are just one of the losses to them, probably. (laughs) Probably. And, you know, a lot of people have ambiguity biases in a lot of different ways. Mine just really happens to be related to price and the sales process. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually a very difficult person to sell to for that reason. Hmm. And it's just that because of this ambiguity bias, my perception of the sales process is negative, whether it should be or not. And I have not been able to break it. I understand that I have it, but it's so ingrained in my psyche that sometimes they'll, this sales process will be happening and I'll be going, I'm getting mad. And I know exactly yeah. why I'm getting mad. And I really shouldn't be getting mad, but I'm getting mad. <laughs> and yeah. I can't. I can't use logic to get myself out of this one. So it's probably my biggest struggle right now. I mean, I've recognized a lot of them over the years and worked on them. Mm-hmm. But that one, I, I almost laugh about the fact that I just can't get past it. Well, nobody's perfect, Tracy. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I Unless you ask my mother and then I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but that's her opinion, not mine. <laughs> yeah. So what about you? What are some of your uh, your biases? Oh, God, do you have like five hours? I could go on for a while, but a couple (laughs) jump out at me looking at the list that we're going to give people. I definitely have a couple that I struggle with. Um, Availability bias is a big one for me. So this is where your personal experience carries more weight than a body of evidence, a large range of results. And those could be results from other people, research, whatever. And so I'll tell you my personal experience around that. I may have mentioned this on the show before, but just briefly, I do a show called Call Time Atlanta. It's an interview show. I interview people in the entertainment industry because part of my life is an actress. Um, I do acting in addition to being an entrepreneur. And when I started this interview show, I had some people on the project with me on the show and they didn't work out. And, you know, I'm not just blaming them or just blaming me. There was blame to go around, but... The upshot of it was that it was a very negative experience for me. And it was the first time I had ever hired people to work for me. (laughs) And it ended up just blowing up in my face. And ever since then, I have been extremely reluctant to bring anybody onto that project, much less any other project that I'm working on. And I've become super picky. I think you need to be picky anyway as an entrepreneur because you don't want to entrust this, you know, baby that you're birthing, your business is your baby. And you don't want to just entrust that to just any old buddy who may or may not help it along, who might harm it. So I think having become very picky about this is a good thing, but I'm at the point where I just will not allow people into that space anymore, uh, when not without a lot of vetting or if unless I've known them for a very long time and I know their work ethic. That whole experience just really soured me. And so now I have this availability bias around my personal experience being so negative outweighs what I know to be true in that you can find good people to work for you. It's I hear this all the time. Tracy's found people to work for her that are very good. The podcasts that I listen to, they talk about people that they've found online through websites like Upwork and any other freelancing website out there. And I just like... My hair stands on end when I hear that because I keep referring back to this horrible experience that I had of hiring people that I knew, much less hiring people that I don't know. So that is a big one for me. Um, Mm -hmm. The other one that has been a lifelong struggle, but not as much anymore, thankfully, 
is I do suffer from the planning fallacy. And that's when you underestimate how much time it will take to complete something. I've always been very bad at that. Um, planning has not come naturally to me. I've had to work very hard at getting even to the point where I'm at now, where I do plan a lot of things and my calendar is organized and all that stuff, but it took a long time to get here. So, And I still often fall back into my bad habits when it comes to planning, just because that's the bad habits are natural for me. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I have to constantly work against them. Those are the two big ones for me, but there are more that we could go over. Yeah, and it's funny. I suffer from that one also, and you mm. know I am a massive planner. I do, but I do. I'm kind of surprised to hear that you suffer from that one, actually, to tell you the well, truth. Well, basically, my perception is that things can be done a lot quicker than they can, especially when they involve other people. Mm-hmm. I just have really high expectations for how other people are going to perform, and I never seem to, well, it's not that I never, but on a regular basis, I fail to put enough time in the plan to get a project done that one trips me up quite often just because of my perception is that the whole world's going to move as fast as I move and that quite often I overestimate my own abilities of how long it's going to take to accomplish something I think really a large percentage of the population probably suffers from planning fallacy and you know it's funny because that one actually comes I think really in conjunction with the uh, overconfidence bias that I have. And I think you have that one also. And basically, it's just kind of the perception that your abilities and your knowledge base is probably more than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs are just famous for having overconfidence bias. And it's one reason we take more risk and Mm -hmm. we do things that, you know, the average person wouldn't do. I think it's very beneficial to us as entrepreneurs as long as it doesn't go to an extreme. Yeah, actually on that note, I do have that bias as well. And I can tell you my personal experience with that kind of bias is I am chronically overconfident about how many things I can take on at any given time Mm -hmm. to the point where like loading up my calendar is I almost get a high from it because I just look at it as, oh my God, I am going to accomplish all these things and so much. And it's like this drug for me. (laughs) (laughs) And, and I do accomplish, I feel like I do accomplish a lot in spite of my planning (laughs) fallacy, but I just know, in fact, I was thinking about this in the car ride yesterday when I was going to an appointment. I'm like, because my calendar is starting to fill up quite a lot now with this show, the other shows that I'm doing, some consulting work that I just landed. And on the one side, I'm like, all right, I have to be realistic about what I can accomplish at any given time. I can't just go down this rabbit hole of saying yes to everything. And then simultaneously, I'm like, I feel this rush, like, oh my God, yes, I'm just accomplishing and I'm gonna be a high achiever (laughs) and all this stuff. It's so crazy. (laughs) It's like this, you know, these two voices in my head. There's the good angel and the evil angel. (laughs) Yeah. And the evil angel is the overconfidence one. (laughs) Yep. And, And like I said, I know everybody, or at least all entrepreneurs, probably have overconfidence bias. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just need to be aware of it. Be aware that you have it and step back and look at things logically every once in a while. (laughs) And I think it really, it and planning fallacy a lot of times really go hand in hand. Yeah, I would say. You know, there's a thing called conservatism bias. If you have this one, especially as a business owner and entrepreneur, it can really be harmful. But it's basically when your perception of like new information is somewhat fearful, you're kind of scared of change and so you're reluctant or slow to accept new information. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny, you know, years ago, back in the late, mid to late nineties, when we finally fully automated all our stores, my mother was working for me and she would have absolutely nothing to do with the computer. Was not gonna touch it, wouldn't look at it, you couldn't show her how to do anything. Dead set, 100% against it. And if it had been any other employee, I'd have fired them, right? But how do you fire your own mother? Yeah. She wanted to be there. She wanted to be helpful. She wanted to be involved. And I couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And I took her on a trip. And I don't even remember where it was. I just, I can see the inside of the building, but I have no idea where we were. 
we were trying to find an office and we walk in and there's this TV screen in the wall and right in the middle of it, it says directory lookup. And my mom walks right up to it, touches it, a list of all the offices comes up. She starts doing the up and down button, scrolling through them. It was taking too long. There's this box up there with the word search next to it. She pushes on search. The keyboard pops up. She types in where we're going and we get the floor and the office number. And the whole time I'm sitting here just chewing off the end of my tongue not to say anything. <laughs> and we get in the elevator, the door shut, and we start going up. And I go, so how'd you like using that computer? What computer? That computer you just used to look up the floor. She's like, that's not a computer, that's a TV. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, Mom, how many times have you walked up to a TV and interacted with it like that? <laughs> I said, it's a computer with a TV attached to it. It wasn't a computer. It wasn't a computer. Oh, my God. Wow. The entire trip, I couldn't convince her it was a computer. We get back home. I tell the employees what happened. They all look at her and go, yeah, that's a computer. That's definitely a computer. She still (laughs) won't believe it and won't accept it. It's not a computer. I'm not getting on that computer. It's not going to happen. My dad tells her, yeah, it's a computer. My sister, yes, it's a computer. And finally, when her friends started making fun of her, she accepted that it was a computer and she probably is capable of learning to use a computer. Wow. Well, hey, at least she <laughs> saw the light at some point. Yeah, you're talking about extreme conservatism bias. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. That is hilarious. Uh, so hopefully none of our listeners have it that bad, <laughs> but <laughs> it is something to be consciously aware of. Oh, boy. Poor mom. Um, let's just go through a couple of the confirmation bias that we know affect business owners to a high percentage. Hmm. Framing effect. That's basically when your perception of information differs based on how it's presented. The exact same information but your perception differs based on how it is presented to you. You'll fall victim of this one very often from salespeople because they can frame the exact information in different ways Mm -hmm. to get you to buy. What's some of the others, Pamela? Oh, social comparison bias. That one's really important as you move through business and you grow business, but this is basically your perception that you really don't want people around you that are going to compete on you with your strengths. You're going to have a tendency not to hire someone that has your strengths. Well, early on in business, we say hire for your weaknesses so you can build a better team. But at a point, your business will grow to the point that you need to step back out of a production position and become more of the leader of the organization. And at that point, you really need to hire someone that has your exact strengths or even better at it than you are, because if you hire below your own strengths, then you're going to hurt the team and your production is going to go down. So you have to be comfortable having people around you that, quote unquote, compete with you on your own strengths. Mm -hmm. Attribution bias. That's the one where you will automatically perceive something going wrong is someone else's fault. Oh, that drives me up a wall oh can I just say (laughs) that that is one bias that I have throughout my life most of my life that I can remember that I've been conscious of not having I think Mm -hmm. I've always been pretty good at taking responsibility in fact probably taking more responsibility for situations sometimes than I should but it drives me up a damn wall when I see others looking around, blaming others, and in business, in personal, in politics, it doesn't matter when it happens, I just want to strangle people (laughs) when they blame others instead of looking objectively at the situation. Yeah, you know, it's the economy's fault. But basically, you just have to be aware that you're doing this and step back and look at the situation objectively. Quit saying, well, it's his fault it didn't happen or it's her fault that this failed. No, what's the real reason? Why wasn't that person able to perform? Well, yeah, even if it is the economy, even if the economy can be partly to blame, that doesn't absolve you of reacting in a positive way, in a constructive way to that circumstance. The economy is just the circumstance, but the way you react, your decisions you make based off of that reality are what matter. 
Right. Um, there's the, I think this is a dumb name, but they call it the hyperbolic discounting bias. And this is basically where you have a perception that you would rather get an immediate payoff. You want the results now. You want whatever is available now rather than waiting and taking the time to actually have a larger gain later on. It's like when you win the lottery and you can choose between getting a full payout immediately or getting paid over a period of months or years, but Mm -hmm. then you get more of it if you wait. Yeah. There are people out there who have the ability to properly invest money that can do better, but they're few and far between. But, you know, I see this one a lot with especially new business owners who just, they got to make that sale, got to make that sale. It's all about that money rather than about building a relationship and a long-term, you know, relationship with a client base. That one, I think, does affect entrepreneurs pretty seriously, and, and I don't know that people really think about it that way. I think some entrepreneurs, rather than having a strategy, the hyperbolic discounting is their strategy. They think that mm-hmm. if they just get some short-term gains, low-hanging fruit, blah, 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 they can build on that. And yes, that can be true. But they use it as a strategy rather than having a really well-thought-out direction that they're going to go in. Yeah. And the one that I think is the saddest that I see is what they call the spotlighting effect. And it's basically where your perception of the amount of time and energy that a person puts into noticing you, your appearance, your behavior Mm -hmm. is basically way overblown. People are not that interested in you. Yeah. (laughs) Get out there, do something, make a fool of yourself because tomorrow they're not even going to remember it. Yeah. Even if they get a little chuckle today, tomorrow they're not even going to remember. Put yourself out there and quit worrying about what everybody else thinks. So How many of these cognitive bias that we've just gone over do you recognize in yourself? Everybody procrastinates, right? If you don't recognize any of these in your behavior and decision making, then you suffer from the worst cognitive bias of all, the blind spot bias. And it's basically your failure to recognize your own biases. When I first started studying how the brain makes decisions, I discovered that I had a whole slew of these things. But as I recognized how they were affecting my decision-making process, I was able to change my perspective on a number of things. Well, what matters the most is not that you have cognitive biases. Everybody has these. You're not going to change how your subconscious mind works overnight. What matters is that you are aware of these cognitive biases and that you become more conscious of what your subconscious mind is doing and that you look logically at whether your perception, your understanding and your impression of a situation is helping or hurting you that basically you don't have that blind spot bias that Tracy mentioned that you try and look objectively at yourself the biases that you may have and how they may be helping or hurting you yeah and you know with conscious practice you will change how your subconscious processes information but like Pam said it's not going to happen overnight And you might never change your initial gut reactions, but at least you'll be able to stop and reframe your perception so that it's serving you rather than hurting you. So which of these biases do you recognize in yourself and are they affecting your perception in ways that are limiting you? We would like to know. So head on over to howbusinessreallyworks.com slash perception And let us know in the comments to this episode or click the contact link and send us a message. You'll also be able to find the links to the resources about cognitive biases on that episode page. Yeah, and don't forget to sign up for the email newsletter. We have a vision, goals, and focus workbook that we want to put into your hands and you will get it if you sign up for our email newsletter. This will help you gain clarity and focus in your daily quest for success And we are giving it to subscribers for free through August. So people, it's free now. Take advantage. (laughs) After August, it will no longer be free. We're going to start charging for it. So get that while you can. Sign up for the newsletter. And remember, please like this episode. Share this episode. And if you are listening in iTunes, please give us a review. We would really appreciate hearing your thoughts, seeing your review, 
And getting a review in iTunes will help us be found by more people, and that will help us help more people like you to succeed in your business. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope that this has given you some food for thought about all the different biases that are out there and how they may be affecting you and what you can do about them. Please tune in next time and we'll see you on our next episode. Bye-bye.